Welcome back to another episode of In Systems We Trust. My name is Mark Key. I'm your host, and today I'm speaking with Goodrin Hoffmeister. Goodrin brings more than 15 years of experience securing major gifts for nonprofit organizations. For eight years, she managed capital campaigns, feasibility studies, and annual fund campaigns for a fundraising consulting firm before launching her own business in 2016. With her guidance, clients have secured their largest gifts ever. Welcome to the show, Goodrin. Thank you, Marquis. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome. I'm glad we got to do this. Uh, I know when we started talking about doing this episode, it was quite some time ago. I'm excited to chat about everything in the nonprofit space. Uh, I know you use Asana for a lot of your your fundraising uh, efforts and to run your business. I love Asana as well and love implementing these solutions. So I'm excited to hear not only more about your your business, philanthropic um, fundraising, but also how you utilize the tool to help your, your customers. But before we get there, let's just back up a little bit. Just t- tell me about your story and uh, kind of just share a bit about your background and how you got involved in uh, nonprofit fundraising. Sure. Yeah. Like a lot of folks, I didn't necessarily grow up with a dream to become a nonprofit fundraiser, but I knew after college that I wanted to work with nonprofits and I just wasn't sure in what way. So I started working with nonprofits and kind of got started getting groomed for fundraising pretty early on. Um, Other than a a, a brief stint doing marketing and communications for a nonprofit, my entire career has been in fundraising. And most of it was, uh, like you mentioned, I was with a big firm. And then I've actually spent now eight years, so eight years at the firm and eight years with my own business, going on eight years. And my passion is major gifts and specifically six and seven figure gifts. That's what really lights me up. And we love to have that transformational, that transformational experience happen for our clients. Mm. Um, So we tend to work with clients that are on the cusp of growth. Maybe they're just starting out and they're about to embark on, you know, transforming the organization and from maybe volunteer run to being staff led, or they've been around for some time and it's time to level up. And so they usually have a very big project in mind and they're trying to partner with these donors who believe in their vision and we help bring the two together and Mm -hmm. really accelerate their growth. Love that. Why those those sizes of, of gifts specifically? You mentioned six figure gifts. Is it because of the impact that you can have helping those organizations raise those funds? Just curious as to um, where where that comes into play. Sure. And there's lots of different types of fundraising, and I don't want to you know geek out too much on fundraising, but just one way to think of it is that you've got your more transactional types of gifts, which are you know somebody logs on and gives you a hundred dollars. You know, maybe you have an event and there's, you know, table sponsorships and that sort of thing. Then there's more of the relationship side. And that's where I, I shine. I I just enjoy relationships, you know, helping build relationships. And that's, I like to work with people who really invest in relationships. And those are the people, those are the nonprofit leaders that are going to kind of attract the investor types, you know, the types of donors, whether it be a foundation or an individual that believe in the vision and want to partner and invest in that organization's growth. And Mm -hmm. of course, you know, capacity is at at play here, but for those who are capable of a six or seven figure gift, it's almost an afterthought. It's really built upon that partnership, that relationship, that trust that takes time to develop And it's something that people either understand how to do or they don't, but there are, there is a system to it. There's that art and there's that science. So the, the art of it, it, you can't really teach people is, you know, how to be relational, how to connect with others and how to, how to build that rapport. But then there's the more system side of it, the more science side of it, which we're going to talk about today in order to be able to support, because it's not often in the same person, you know, (laughs) who's somebody who's really good at um, building rapport, they might not have the best systems in place to support their efforts. 
Awesome. And yeah, I definitely want to dive into the systems and the science behind it. Before we do, typically when you um, hear about people that are supporting nonprofits or have started uh, a a nonprofit organization, there is typically a personal story that's brought them into this world. Was there one for you there, you know, um, that really brought you into doing this conscious work and supporting these people? Because I'm hearing a lot of like passion behind what you're saying. Right. Was there anything that you can tie this back to that really inspired you to start doing this work? Hmm. It's I I hear what you're saying with these nonprofit leaders. I mean, they do. They have these amazing stories. And I got to remember, I've not started my own nonprofit. So (laughs) my hat's off to them. I always have been on the business side of it. I've you know worked for nonprofits or a nonprofit consulting firm or now my own firm. So if your question is more what drove me, what inspired me, it was definitely my daughter. Um, Yeah. So I, well, prior to that, you know, I was in the workaday world and once I had my daughter, I realized that I wanted to focus more time on learning how to be a mom. And, and, but I also wanted to have my business and I thought, you know, if I could, I was scared, of course, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I was scared to leave my very well paid, you know, job with benefits and all of that. And, you know, all that security to go out on my own. But I thought, if I can do this, you know, how inspiring would that be that if I could not only be a mom and, and, you know, have invest that time with, I now have two, um, with my children, but also be able to, you know, give back in a professional way and and be able to build a business. And so when she's, you know, proud of me and she runs around telling everyone my mom's a boss, you know, that's, that's what makes me inspired to want to keep going on the tough days. I love that. Yeah. There's so much that we do for, for our kids and for our family. So I'm sure a lot of listeners are resonating with that right now. And I mean, with any good business, Goodrin, like there's, we show up here, we're entrepreneurs, we're, we're bosses, as your, as your daughter mentioned, you know, we're, we're all trying to solve problems. So what would you say are some of the common problems that exist for your customers that you are trying to solve for? Yes, yes. Please talk to us if you are experiencing any of these things, because it's so common and you're not alone, but let's say you're a nonprofit organization and you have maybe a strong mailing list, maybe you have a successful event, and maybe you have some donors that are, they'll give you a $5,000 gift, maybe unsolicited, Um, maybe you've been told, oh, you really should talk to so-and-so, but you don't have anyone on the team who's really focusing you in on those four, five, six, and seven-figure gifts, and so it's all on you as the executive director, or possibly board member to try to figure out the puzzle pieces. And we really want to work with those people, like I said, who have the connections, have the skills, have the abilities, have an amazing organization with a mission that we can get behind, but maybe just don't, they just don't have the people and the systems in place to be able to support them. Because yeah, like I said, these are my people. We love to work with high performing executive directors of you know, amazingly impactful nonprofit organizations that have the potential, but maybe can't afford the most expensive fundraising consulting, or maybe they tried working with an individual fundraising consultant and they couldn't get the um, results that they were looking for. So we're a boutique fundraising consulting firm, so we can really provide that one-on-one and that handholding, but at the same time, we're large enough that we have some processes, you know, and We've, there's just not that many fundraising consulting consultants out there that have done, you know, more than a dozen capital campaigns, more than a dozen feasibility studies. We've had these conversations with donors over and over and over again. We know what motivates them. We know that why somebody's motivated to give a six or seven figure gift. So we're going to be able to lend that expertise, even if it's brand new. Yeah, I want to talk about some of the systems and the science behind this because years ago when I worked for a marketing agency, we had um, one of our initiatives was to support a local nonprofit. And so this was helping them to market their events and to manage um, donors and like b- build a platform. A-, a lot of the work that you do, but not as you know detailed and granular. And one of the problems that 
you know, what come up often is this thing about donor fatigue, right? Like going to the same people in, you know, some smaller communities um, and, and trying to think of how can we engage these people, keep them involved, keep them interested. And then there's the issue of, you know, competing, quote unquote, um, organizations that, you know, we're all just, you know, kind of fighting for, for the same the same pool uh, of funding. And so I'd love to talk about how you structured your business, maybe to address some of those problems. That's That's been my experience. Your problems are obviously very different. But what are some of the things in place if you were to approach a nonprofit today or they were to, you know, get on a call with you, how would you approach, you know, working with them and getting them to the point where we could change that narrative and get them out of the 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 rut that they're in? Absolutely. And I'm going to turn that on its head a little bit, the assumption that there is donor fatigue, because the reality is a very small group of philanthropists in this in North America, anyway, oh, I can speak for the US anyway, are supporting the vast majority of nonprofits. And I, I know it might people not, might not want to hear it. But um, if people are familiar with the Lego principle, the 8020 rule, it's if you really start to distill it down it's basically the top three percent of high net worth individuals in the country in the us are are providing i think it's something like 70 or 80 percent of all of the fundraising that's supporting nonprofits so it's very highly concentrated at the top and there's not donor fatigue there philanthropists are going to be constantly supporting their alma mater, their house of worship. You need to, as a nonprofit organization, get in there and get in to have those conversations with the don those donors. But once they're committed to you, they're, they're generally committed for life unless that relationship breaks down at some point. Um, so, I mean, I would love for fundraising to be more democratic. And there's certainly democratic components to it. Like I said, you know, the $100 donor, the, you know, table sponsorships, that sort of thing. But really, our sweet spot, the world that we operate in, is going to be, you know, more of your billionaires, these, and they're supporting causes left and right, you know, it's just part of how they see their role. They're either philanthropic or they're not. And I'm sorry, but if they're not supporting you, and you had the opportunity, then it just, it just didn't resonate with them. So try another conversation with somebody else. But it's more about getting networked in and then forming those partnerships and then continuing to nurture those partnerships. Okay. And so what does some of the day-to-day -day look like? If we had to look at, I know you use Asana, um, how, how do you use tools like that to keep everything streamlined and organized? And are you helping then your, your customers to implement tools like Asana and build this out in their businesses. I'm just curious how it all works because with so many moving parts and so many, you know, relationships you have to maintain and, you know, campaigns you have to run, there's, there's gotta be a lot going on behind the scenes. So what, what's your approach? It, exactly. And, and what you said about so many things going on behind the scenes and so many things that need to be run and we can't come in and take over and do all of that. You know, they need to partner with people like you to really set up their systems to make sure that if they have an auction, that that's all systematized. Or, you know, if they have an annual appeal, that that's systematized. Where we come in is, like you said, maintaining those relationships with those top donors. And it can fall by the wayside because they're so busy, you know, dealing with the, the gala or, you know, the annual appeal. And it can be distracting. So what we do is we, we take a look at who are their top supporters, you know, who's giving at least $1,000 a year sometime in the last five years, and we start to analyze that list. We're going to pull that list into Asana, and as we gather more data, let's say, you know, we find out that somebody who gave them $5,000 last year is actually capable of giving a million dollars, we start to feed that information into Asana, and then when we meet weekly with our with our clients, we have that list and those that are we think have the most potential are going to rise to the top of the agenda. And yet we have all that data there in front of us. And we, you know, do a screen share and we go through Asana together and we talk about each of those prospects, you know, and in, in, in a subtask in Asana, you know, gotta love the subtasks are you need to call them, you know, and they need to check that off. So of course we love it when our clients dive into Asana themselves and they check it off themselves and they 
type up, you know, how the conversation went, and then we're able to proceed from there. Of course, we understand not every client is going to use Asana, so we manage that for them. Um, but by having that system in place, and then of course, it can always be downloaded into Excel. You know, we're, we're ahead of schedule with a, a capital campaign right now. Um, they wanted to raise originally five, and then they said, no, actually, we really need to raise seven. And they are barreling toward that seven million before um, the, the two year time frame that we had initially outlined. And so they're already like, how do we get this data? And we just, you know, at a click of a button, we're able to export everything from Excel, from Asana into Excel of all of the donor data, you know, who had talked to whom and when, what are the next steps, you know, what did they give? Of course, it doesn't replace a CRM on their end. But what we find with CRMs, and we could, this could be a whole other topic, <laughs> is why CRMs are not working for nonprofits when it comes to actively fundraising. CRMs are a great deposit, repository for data, but they're not great at getting organizations, with individuals within organizations to take specific actions with that particular donor. So you can go in and pull up their record in the CRM, and you know there's many different fundraising CRMs. I'm not going to I'm not going to, you know, highlight one over the other. The, the, they're all the same in that you can pull up their, their profile in the CRM and you can see everything that happened. But just because you have that historic data doesn't tell you, okay, well, who's calling this person and when? There are some organizations that will use their CRM to that level, but it's very rare. And it takes almost like a dedicated person to just do that. Um, when really what we want people is getting out from behind their desk and going meeting with people. So we keep track of all that. You know, who who is supposed to call whom? A meeting was supposed to happen. It needed to be rescheduled. When did it, did it get rescheduled? You know, who's going on the meeting? It's just the devil's in the details. It's, you know, and that's where things start to fall down. And then before they know it, oh, you know, the meeting never happened and it's been three months. Meanwhile, that donor has moved on to another organization that was following up. So great. So much information there to unpack. And um, I, I love what you said about the use of CRMs versus Asana, right? Like there's the tasks, the actionable, who is doing what, by when, whereas a CRM is the repository of information, the tracker of activity, um, and, and the keeper of all of the data, essentially. So um, I, I love the really practical application there. Now, are, are there just uh, just a quick aside, are there CRMs that you would recommend over others that better integrate with Asana or does it come down to personal preference or how you set up the tool and then train around the tool? I'm just curious what your experience has been around CRMs in the nonprofit space. I would love to dive deeper into a CRM discussion with somebody who knows more than I do because it's not my area of expertise. I've certainly... I, you know, in my in my previous life, I was embedded inside of nonprofit, so I certainly interacted with multiple CRMs, and every organization complains about their CRM. <laughs> no organization is happy with it. Um, so I think there's tremendous potential for innovation, and for me, Asana has been a workaround. So again, I don't want to highlight one CRM over another because I think that's a whole different conversation, and I don't feel qualified to have that conversation. Because if I were to say one CRM, somebody else would be like, no, we tried that, didn't work for us. We, we prefer this one. More power to an organization if they're happy with their CRM, then they figured out something that a lot of organizations haven't figured out. Um, right. But to me, I've yet to see a situation where there wasn't a need for either Asana or something else if an organization is happy with another tool. It's not about the tool. I know you talk about it's about the systems, not the particular tool. But what we find with a tool like Asana is it just makes it so incredibly obvious what is supposed to happen next, where that's just not anywhere in the CRM. Yeah, and I love that that plug in there. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's not about the tool. It's about how you use it, right? And so um, earlier you, you mentioned that, you know, not all of your clients will use Asana and so you manage it for them. And so uh, as, part of this, as part of this system, you know, are you deploying Asana in their space and teaching them and how to, to track it there? Or are you managing all of the campaigns inside of your space? 
inside of your own Asana instance? It depends. It depends on the project. We can go either way. Um, so we we partner with others who who have more of that Asana expertise, you know, um, such as yourself. It really takes a person who understands the ins and outs of Asana to get it set up for them. Yeah. Um, whereas we on the fundraising side are really more focused on managing the data on our end in such a way that it's actionable for the client. Um, so if you if you wanted to speak more to organizations that are like, oh, it sounds like we really could use Asana internally. I think that's something that you could speak to better than I can. But yeah. when it comes time to actually fundraise, that's where they need to talk to us. <laughs> totally. and, and, and I love this work, right? Like a lot of our clients, we are building out um, these systems within their Asana spaces where not only do we have a database, but, you know, if we need to, you know, build out a light CRM for them and introduce automation that does tie in their email and, you know, some tracking, we can absolutely do that as well. We've built out sales pipelines inside of Asana, replacing HubSpot or Salesforce, right? And e even for me, we switched off of um, HubSpot as our sales pipeline a few months ago. The, everything was fully integrated. We had our, our CMS on, on HubSpot, our knowledge base was on HubSpot, the CRM was in HubSpot, pipeline and all automation was in HubSpot, but we we're able to at least take out that sales component, put it in Asana, where again, the day-to-day -day tasks are happening, right? We're now tracking revenue and we're integrating um, with other departments as well. So we have finance and the delivery team that needs to know what's happening with that sale as it's upcoming. So as you're talking about like relationships and, and maintaining all that, I'm thinking more about how this can absolutely apply for your customers, right? There's the on the ground, day to day, what's happening. And then there's simply the data and the storing of that data in another tool. So um, I want to talk more about the feature sets uh, of Asana now, like let's talk about your business specifically. And so is there anything that you, that you utilize day to day to manage donor relationships? Like if I had to think about it, portfolios would be one of them to manage the relationships of our clients, let's say in the space and to have, you know, status updates that we can, that we can reference as well to make sure that, you know, the projects are on track, everyone's happy, our team is resourced. Is there anything that you can speak to specifically that you use that has been helpful to you from a feature perspective inside of Asana? Well, you're an Asana ninja and we are not. <laughs> So this, some of the things you're talking about, we aspire to do, and maybe someday. Um, but for now, we mostly are just using the projects. And we do have kind of a light CRM component to Asana. So when you say that you're almost using Asana as your CRM, I've heard different things about whether Asana can be a CRM or not. And I would imagine a nonprofit leader listening could think, oh, can I use Asana for everything? Well, no, it's not a good repository for, you know, if somebody makes a pledge over five years and you need to, you know, capture all of that data. But it is really good for the people management side of it. And that's what we use it for. So it, you don't have to be an Asana ninja. You can start where we're at, and we can certainly help with that, which is, yeah, just setting up a project for all of the prospective donors. And then with, so each of the donors are their own task. So you don't ever check off the task as complete. They just exist as a, as a data point. And mm -hmm. then underneath each of those, um, and we're getting very deep on Asana here, but within each of those tasks. So let's say, you know, Joe Smith is a task, then all of the subtasks are Mary needs to call Joe Smith, you know, and then within that subtask, Mary did call Joe Smith. And he said that you need to follow up with him in three months. And then, okay, Mary needs to follow up with Joe Smith in three months. What did he say? That sort of thing. And that's the, that's where your traditional CRM is is going to all of that information is going to get lost unless you have some sort of system like Asana and a person, let's be real, a person needs to be looking at that yeah. and recognizing, okay, you know, it's time, Mary, it's time to call Joe Smith. Perfect. Sorry if I'm going too deep on Asana. I don't even realize. Yeah, you can. You can. 
<laughs> All right, perfect. You can geek out on a sauna. You lost me. <laughs> Someone who's listening knows what I'm talking about. It's great. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Um, let's, let's back out a little bit and let's talk about the actual approach and the process of you working with your, your customers then. So we know Asana is going to be one of those tools that, you know, nonprofits can implement and I'd love to support them in that. And maybe we can figure something out and talk about what that would look like, Goodrin. But let's talk about the process of you have a qualified nonprofit, you know, they are, are struggling with a lot of the problems that you, that you spoke about earlier. What are the stages that you take them through to, you know, um, really start to roll out this eventual transformation because it's not going to happen quickly. I, I can't imagine. So I'd love to hear about your process a little bit more. Sure. And this is moving away from Asana, although Asana complements this, this work, but sure. it all starts with their vision. You know, um, it, where if you have a big vision and you have the right leaders who feel compelled to help realize that vision, then the money will follow. But if you don't have a big idea, if you don't have a million dollar idea, no one's going to give you a million dollars. So it all starts with that vision. Do you want to grow? Is it a, a school that wants to add a second campus? You know, is your building falling apart and you need to rebuild? Do you want to just serve more youth and, you know, really start to put some numbers around that? So we work with our clients to tell their story. And, you know, we put together a slide deck that we can then shop around to potential donors. In, in tandem with that, we're also figuring out who are their leaders that can really champion this? And is there anyone else that we could recruit to this cause, you know, that could help advocate on behalf of that organization and get in front of the type of donors who could give six or seven figure gifts because peers give to peers, you know? Um, so once we have those ingredients in place, then that's where the systems start to come in. We need to have a prospect list. We need to be working that prospect list and we need to have a plan in place. We need to have a, a, a sequence of steps that we need to undertake in order to be successful and wrap everything up with a bow. You know, we want to have um, smart goals with a specific timeline attached to it. Because leaders, at the end of the day, they want to feel like they accomplished something and they were successful. So let's set up benchmark goals that they can check off and um, feel really good about before, you know, moving on to the next thing. Perfect. I'm going to go back to those, those steps you mentioned in prospecting. There are lots of little steps that we go through. I'd love to even break those down because obviously it's going to tie back to the vision. And I love that you started with that because I'm a firm believer you can't do anything without vision. Um, but like, does it depend, does the, do the steps, sorry, and the time it takes to get there depend on what that vision is? I'm just curious what those steps are and what time frame we're then working with in the prospecting stage. Because, you know, if we have a new opportunity, it might take longer to convert them and make them into a believer than someone who's already teed up. So what yeah. do the steps actually look like? Yes, it is different for every organization, but generally you're looking at between a year and two years if it's a big capital campaign. And when it's a capital campaign, it's typically they're trying to raise millions of dollars and it's for a very concrete project that has a beginning, middle and end. We try to apply the same principles because, I mean, good fundraising practice is good fundraising practice regardless with our clients that are not in a capital campaign to help them grow their major guest program. And in that case, then we really do need to look at, yeah, exactly. Are these donors already teed up? Can we ask them for a six-figure gift tomorrow? I mean, that has happened where, you know, we've said, we think you can ask this donor for $500,000. And they do, and they get it. You know, it, it happens. It's rare, but it happens. Um, usually, it's a process where, you know, it's typically going to take around six months of conversation to get a donor who's like, new, you know, maybe they've attended some events, maybe you had a few conversations all the way to the point where it's time to ask them for a gift. Um, so it really just depends on what type of scenario we're talking about. But we would like to see an organization commit at least six months to see real results on up to two years if it's a very large capital campaign, you know, with an ambitious goal such as this seven million dollar campaign that, like I said, it ended up going more quickly than than the original two-year timeline. So 18 months is pretty typical for those, for those big capital campaigns. But we love to remind organizations, you do not need to be in a capital campaign to secure a six or seven figure gift. 
And let's let's talk back um, up to the the vision now, because you're mentioning like these really like lofty goals. And so, are you helping them to draft or then perfect their vision and then distill out the goals and the KPIs and the ownership around it? Because you know that can be just like really deep work in itself that can take a lot of time. And I can only imagine that you receive visions that either are very shallow or are, you know, maybe lofty and not realistic. So how do you work them through, you know, that phase? Are you, are you doing that deep work with them or do they have to be at a certain stage and then you come back and then move on to the, the prospecting? I think it's more the latter, but you did what you alluded to is more strategic planning. And we can help out organizations that are in the strategic planning mode because if they have not done a strategic plan, it really makes it hard to have a strong, what's called case for support, which is that vision. So it all starts with the strategic plan. And then out of the strategic plan, you start to put some concrete numbers. Okay, how much would we need to raise to realize this goal? So I, don't, I want to separate out strategic planning, which might include some more, you know, HR pieces, you know, maybe there's some specifics around, you know, office space, you know, let's put all of that aside. And, and that's a different area, but specifically around fundraising goals. Okay. So we want to double the number of youth served. How much is that going to take? Do we need another million? Okay. Once we raise that million, do we need to continue raising more and more or can, or is that going to be enough? So starting to make it a smart goal, you know, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time bound is really where we come in. It's okay if there's some fuzziness around some of those areas, but typically by the time we're involved, they know, you know, we're, we just um, found out today that we're working with an organization that secured a physical space, but it needs to be renovated. And they're just starting out. They're brand new at fundraising. So they have, but they have this space and people can see it, you know, it's something tangible. And so it is a smart goal. They know exactly how much they need to raise. They know when they need to raise it by. So they're really just coming to us to do the fundraising implementation side. Um, you can choose to say pass if you don't want to answer this question. But um, when it comes to working with your clients, then are you, do your agreements, you know, um, state that you're taking a percentage of the, the, the gifts that are then received, or is there an upfront cost or a retainer for the duration that you're working with them? I'm just curious what that relationship looks like once you have uh, an organization that's committed to working with you. Sure. Yeah. I, I, happy to answer that because those of us in this world, we're not, we're often all talking to each other and we all know the lingo and, you know, speak the same language, but um, you work with nonprofits. You're just not, you know, you're not a fundraiser. So of course it's like, how does this work? And those of us who are in this field, we, many of us belong to the association of fundraising professionals. And there's a code of ethics that we follow that, disallows taking a percentage of any fundraising. And when you think about it, the reason why that's unethical is because then there's a personal incentive for, a, for us to bring a donor across the finish line when really we do not have control as fundraisers. That's completely the in the donor's purview, whether they want to give to the organization or not. We're just there to make sure did you make the phone call? You know, did you write the follow-up letter? Did you get the pledge form? You know, we put a system and structure into place, but the relationship always, always stays with the nonprofit organization. So that's why we're consultants. And that's what's so great about bringing consultants in because when you have a staff person, oftentimes the relationship will leave with that staff person. But when you bring a consultant in, the relationship stays with the organization. So we operate on, and this is very typical, you know, we have a monthly retainer um, when we work with our clients and, and they're committed to working with us. And some months there's a lot of work and a lot of money coming in. Some months things are quiet, but with that retainer, we are committed to each other. We're going to stick this out and we're ultimately going to be successful because they've committed to us long-term and we've committed to them. Thank you for answering that. I didn't realize that there were ethical concerns around. I, it obviously makes sense, right? And if I had thought more about it, but yeah, I, I had no idea. So that's really, really good to know. Um, yeah. 
Goodman, what is the future or how do you envision the future of, of nonprofit fundraising going? I'm in the, the process improvement space where I'm always iterating, always, you know, changing. And, you know, we see industries change, you know, some for the better and some for the worse. Are, have there been any trends or, you know, signs of the times that you've seen that could impact the future? And, and what are your thoughts on where this could uh, go? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wish more nonprofit organizations would work with you and people like you because I do think the future is going to be about systematizing because there's so much people power that has gone into the more transactional gifts in the past. And it's just not a good use of a person's time to be dealing with things like mailings and CRMs and, you know, just the, the data piece when really those more transactional gifts, you know, your hundred dollars here, your thousand dollar gifts are really just a starting point to be able to build upon in order to have a major gifts program, because a major gifts program is really the, the biggest lever you can pull in terms of your fundraising future. And the organizations, the really sophisticated organizations know that. So they've automated everything, you know, on the more transactional side of fundraising, so they can focus their people on the relationships. And I think you know, we're all looking at a world where it's like, oh, AI is going to take that over. And oh, you know, that can all be automated. And it's like, yeah, because that's not what our brains are for. You know, our brains are for connecting with other people, not being a data monkey, you know, behind a desk, you know, we need to get out and talk to people. And that's where the money comes, you know, whether you're a business owner or a nonprofit leader, the money comes from the relationships. So do that well, and the money will follow. So well said. So well said. This is typically we need people like you to set up those systems. <laughs> Absolutely. Let, let, let's just call it there. I was going to say, is there a message that you have for your key audience today? But I think you nailed it, right? Like, focus on the relationships. The money will follow. Um, thank you so much, Goodrin. Uh, and yeah, okay. I'd, I'd love to continue this conversation. I mean, if you're listening and you are a nonprofit um, head or leader or in that space and you're looking for more support, I mean, Goodrin is obviously a great person to reach out to. Um, if you need a system to build this in, uh, I'd love to connect with you as well. Um, Goodrin, for the people that are interested or have more questions, where's the best place that they can reach out to you to connect and learn more? Yes, currently we are on LinkedIn. We do have a website, philanthropicfundraising.com. Would love to send people to LinkedIn for more of the live posts, communication. That's where we really like to talk to people who um, are like-minded. Um, but you can also hop on the website and enter in your email address and we'll be in touch that way. But yeah, let's let's keep the conversation going online on LinkedIn. I know you post on there as well. So we can we, we can start some posts together because I know your audience, they need systems. They also need fundraising help. There's so much synergy there. Yeah, well, I often get a lot of questions from these these recordings. And so, I mean, once this comes out, I'm sure there'll be lots and we can probably figure something out and cross promote even further content. So I'd be happy to do that. Keep the conversation going. Excellent. Awesome. And listeners, as always, all of the links will be in the show notes. Thank you so much, Goodrin, for being on the show today and uh, taking the time to just to share uh, just some insight into this world that a lot of people don't get to see uh, behind the curtain. So thanks so much. Thank you.